We study billionaires, and this is episode 51 of The Investor's Podcast. Broadcasting from Bel Air, Maryland, this is The Investor's Podcast. They'll read the books and summarize the lessons. They'll test the waters and tell you when it's cold. They'll give you actionable investing strategies. Your host, Preston Pish and Stig Broderson. Hey, everybody. How you doing out there? This is Preston Pish, and I'm your host for The Investor's Podcast. And as usual, I'm accompanied by my co-host, Stig Broderson, out in Denmark. So today, I think everyone's going to really enjoy this conversation because we're talking about a person that a lot of people know here in the United States, at least, and that is Mark Cuban. Uh, he's a billionaire that lives out of Dallas, Texas. He's the owner of the Dallas Mavericks, which is a basketball team. He's also the owner of Landmark Theaters, Magnolia Pictures, and he's the chairman of the HDTV cable network AXSTV. Um, and what people really know him for is that he's the shark on the uh, TV show, The Shark Tank, uh, which is this really popular TV show where a bunch of people come on and pitch their ideas. And then uh, there's some sharks that either take some equity in the business by investing in them or they pass on the deal. So we came in contact with Mark really from the Shark Tank TV. That's how we came to know him and really had a lot of respect for him because you can hear how smart he is from a business sense uh, just by the way that he interacts with people on the show. But I want to give you a little bit of a history because a lot of people don't realize how Mark Cuban made his money. Um, and I was just going to give you a quick history on Mark Cuban. This was not in his book. And just so you know, what we're doing today is we're going to be reviewing uh, Mark Cuban's book, How to Win at the Sport of Business. And it's not a long read. You can buy this on Amazon. It looks like it was like self-published. I think he... Uh, <laughs> He circumnavigated the uh, publishing industry, which I found really funny and, and quite awesome. But that's the book that we're going to be reviewing here after we just kind of give you a, a brief background on how Mark made his money. So early on, Mark always had this entrepreneurial spirit um, whenever he was in college. I think I remember him talking about this in the book where he started his own business uh, when he was in college and it was a bar and he wasn't even of age to to drink, but yet he owned a bar in college and it seemed like the, the bar did pretty well. And um, yeah, so anyway, so he went to Indiana University, which is right there near uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and that's where he grew up. He's a he's from Pittsburgh. So I obviously have very strong ties to the Pittsburgh area. So I like that part of it for sure. He went to IUP. And then after he graduated he went down to Texas with some buddies and they just started bartending. I think that's pretty much what he knew from college because he started the bartending business. But he goes down there, he's bartending, and then he starts working for this business called Your Business Software, which was like this one of the first PC software businesses down in Dallas, Texas. So he's working there and he didn't even work there for a year before he got fired. And the reason that he got fired is because he decided to take it upon his own initiative to go out on a sales call to meet with a customer instead of opening the store. So he gets back, uh, the store owner, you know, he's looking at the store owner like, Hey, I just sealed the deal over here with one of these, uh, customers. And the, the manager of the shop looked at Cuban and was like, yeah, you're fired. You didn't open the store. And, uh, Cuban just didn't understand. He, he was just like, well, what do you mean? I just got you a deal. Like I just land you another client and the guy just fired him. So Mark was very frustrated. He decided to go out and start his own business because of that experience. So Mark started his own business and the name of the business that he started was called Micro Solutions, which was another software company. And he goes and starts us up. The thing does really well. And then uh, CompuServe, which was uh, a subsidiary of H&R Block, buys out Cuban for $6 million dollars. Uh, I mean, so after taxes, it's reported that he made $2 million on the deal. So I want to say that he was in his 20s, late 20s at this point. And so he had $2 million in his pocket. In his, I can't remember if it was in his book or his blog that I read that he had all this money and he was, you know, obviously really pumped that he had made so much money at such a young age, really felt like he was on top of the world. And uh, he wanted to just kind of take it easy and just take this nice conservative approach to just invest that small chunk of money for him. Now that's a small chunk of money, but he wanted to take that money and just kind of invest it, do something really safe and secure and just kind of, you know, coast through life. Well, it turns out, uh, by the mid nineties, I want to say it was around 1995, 
he links up with one of his buddies from Indiana University. Uh, the guy's name is Todd Wagner, and they start this new business called AudioNet. And so what they were doing is they were combining uh, Cuban had an intense interest in sports. So did uh, Todd Wagner. So they start this thing called AudioNet. And what AudioNet was, was it was broadcasting over the Internet. So if you wanted to uh, tune into like a sports game back in the early, or the mid 1990s, you had to turn on the radio or else you weren't listening to it. But with this, you could log on to the Internet and you could go to their audio net website and you could listen to a sports game from Indiana University or from Notre Dame or from whatever college you want to name. And they would have it being live streamed over the Internet that had never been done before. So that's what made him his money. Now, let's talk some of the numbers, because I know everyone on this show loves to talk numbers like Stig and I. <laughs> so. Everyone knows he became a billionaire off this deal. And just so you know, AudioNet, they ended up buying the domain broadcast.com. So he basically pointed broadcast.com to AudioNet. AudioNet becomes broadcast.com. Uh, and that was around the 1998 time frame that, uh, that the company became known as broadcast.com. So uh, now he's got this company. It's booming. Okay, and by booming, I mean the revenue. So we're talking the top line, not the profit of the business, but the revenue um, for the second quarter was $13.5 million. And he had 330 employees uh, working for him at the end, or I'm sorry, in 1999, he had 330 employees. And then one of his quarters, the, the revenue top line was $13.5 million. So let's just let's just do some quick numbers here and talk about this deal because I'm going to tell you what Yahoo paid for the company and bought him out, uh, which was crazy. <laughs> so if we look at the numbers, uh, that's 26 million, or I'm sorry, 27 million for half the year, and then if we double that, that'll give you the full year revenue. So let's just round it and say he was around 50 to 55 million, just to you know round some numbers. That's his top line. So that's not the profit. So typically, if a company's, you know, I'd say doing well, they're about 10% of their revenue, correct, Stig? Yeah, I'd say that's a fair estimate. Okay. So let's give him the benefit, about, uh, benefit of the doubt and let's give him 20%. And let's just say he's kind of like a, a Google and he can do 20% or whatever, which I highly doubt. He might not even be profitable for, our, for all we know at the time. So... Uh, let's just say that his, his bottom line was maybe $10 million a year. So how much are you willing to pay for a business that's doing $10 million a year? Now I will say there's huge upside with the potential for how this could grow. And because it's something brand new un unknown potential here. I mean, there's lots of value there. I, I, I will definitely admit that there's lots of value there, but just to kind of show people the multiples that were paid back in the 1999 time frame, this is at the peak of the internet bubble, and we're assuming that he has 20% margins on his revenues. He'd be making $10 million for the entire year, and Yahoo purchased Broadcast.com for $5.7 billion. So when we're talking multiples... <laughs> wow, you're, you're really making Facebook sound like a great deal. Press. Yeah, it's a great <laughs> deal. So, you know, if we were talking a 10% margin, $5.7 billion, you're probably at about a thousand multiple uh, for Mark Cuban when he sold his company to Yahoo. So pretty cool. That I think it shows you his negotiation skills, if anything. Yeah, it's called growth investing, Preston. <laughs> it's because we're too much into value investing. <laughs> yeah, I'd say. No, I, and then Stig's exactly right. When you're growth investing, the multiples really don't make sense. And you're just looking at things more from a, a growth of the user base and things like that. You know, stuff I can't even begin to comprehend because there's so much risk associated with it. But, you know, there's people out there that love that kind of stuff. They feel like they understand the space. And so they pay $5.7 billion for it. And like Yahoo, they... If you, if you type in broadcast.com, you know where it takes you. It takes you straight to the Yahoo top level page. And the, all the things that Cuban had created with broadcast.com are pretty much a total wash for Yahoo. So they probably had to write down this whole $5.7 billion acquisition down to nothing onto their income statement. 
because they never did anything with it. I think they fooled around with it for a few years and then they realized that they just really couldn't take it to anything that was had any utility. So that's something else that's totally amazing when you look at this deal for them to pay a multiple of a thousand on something and then to never even use it in the long term was pretty amazing to me. Yeah, and, and to think about that, Yahoo, I think they bid something like a billion dollars on Google, and they weren't too far away from each other, actually, at that point of time. Hmm. Uh, but apparently, the money went to my Cuban. So <laughs> <laughs> so I think that that's, I think that adds a lot of context when you're talking about Mark Cuban, because everyone immediately is just like, oh, he's a billionaire. You know, he's, he's the best there ever was and ever is. And uh, I think that Mark Cuban has a ton to stand on. Don't get me wrong here, but I also like to add that context and for people to really understand the background of how he became a billionaire. It wasn't like he was like Warren Buffett here and he's investing in, you know, he's investing in a bunch of different companies and and all these different backgrounds and slowly growing his money into the billions. Like that, that's not how he did it. He really did it by having a great idea with broadcast.com and then selling it for a multiple of well over a thousand in order to, uh, you know, check that block. But with all that said, I'm not trying to discount Mark Cuban because his book, I loved his book. I thought his book was awesome. And it's a very short read. It's, it's actually, what would you say, Stig? Under 200 pages, I think. Yeah. And, and I think it's uh, in compilation of old blog posts. So it's like the whole format actually makes it, it seems shorter than that. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the format isn't really organized in like a, a logical layout. You can tell that he stole a lot of his uh, blog posts because uh, uh, Cuban's a blogger. If you guys didn't know, Mark Cuban's a blogger. I think it's uh, blog maverick or something like that dot com where you can go uh, read his blog and his blog is fantastic. So I highly recommend it. But they took a lot of his blog posts. He kind of formed it into a book and uh, it's it's really good because it's all located in one area. And I think what he did is he's he took the, the posts that he liked the most that kind of represented his his thought process and he culminated it into this book. So what Stig and I are going to do is we're going to hit the highlights of the book. We thoroughly enjoyed the book and you can also get this on Audibles. That's how I listen to it. But uh, Stig, go ahead and take the first point that you really like from the book. I think the uh, the one thing I, I really like, and there are a few pointers, but one of the things that really resonated with me was that he really encouraged that you start reading. Uh, that was one of the things he talked a lot about. And uh, I think the best example of how important reading is, is that he started in the computer industry when he was like, I want to say 23, 24, something like that, which if you know the computer industry is not that young. I mean, he was not like Bill Gates who started programming since he was like 10 years old or something like that. He didn't know anything about computer in his early 20s. And he said the way that he caught up with his competitors in that industry was simply to, to read. And he was saying it's not just like one hour a day. He was reading day and night. And even today, he's spending something like three hours a day. And he says that he's driving his family crazy because he wants to dedicate so much time uh, reading. And one of the things that he, he talked about, even even though he was, uh, again, back in his early 20s, he was almost broke, was that back then he even thought that 20 bucks or something for a book, that was extremely cheap. And today you can actually do it a lot cheaper than that. And he's saying, why would you not start studying about something that's important to you if it's like 10 bucks and you can get a whole lifetime of experience just by setting aside a weekend to uh, to go through that book? And he said that, when he started, he was sure that all his competitors were doing the same thing. It would be really hard to, to, to catch on. But he said, no one does it. No one sits down and just study a book about how to succeed in the industry. And then that was something that, that really led the foundation to his, uh, to his success. I absolutely love this point. And I love the way that you framed this because... In the book, Cuban talks about how he got ahead initially when he worked for this company, Your Business Software. So... He goes in and he has to sell the software. He knows absolutely nothing about software. And he says that in the book. And so what does he do? He goes and he gets these manuals from things like Lotus and um, uh, Carbon Copy, like these obscure, like old software programs. And he gets the manual and he just starts reading the manual inside out so that he understands the software better than the people that have been working in the software business for the last five years. He he steps in and he just studies this and he reads these manuals like crazy. 
And so then when he goes out on these on sales calls, he knows the software better than anybody else out there. So he educated himself in this field that he had no experience in. And I think there's this is such a, a valuable lesson to everybody out there because if there's something that you don't understand or you don't know, that it's so easy and you hear this so often where people will say, Oh yeah, that's, I'd like to know something about accounting or whatever it might be. And they say, but you know, I, I haven't had any classes on it or I didn't go to college for that. And they just leave it at that. A guy like Mark Cuban's like, I don't know anything about the software business. It's really complex. It's brand new, but you know what? So what? And he says, I'm going to get a manual. I'm going to read it. I'm going to teach myself. And I think people that take that approach to life in general, if there's something you don't understand, go on YouTube, buy a book, do whatever it takes to learn it. And I'll tell you, it'll take you places. I know from personal experience, I didn't know how to program. I had, you know, I'd taken some classes when I was in high school. I took one year of programming in high school and I took one year of programming in college, neither in any language that would help me to build a website on the internet. You know what? I went after it. I, I went out and I'm not trying to, to, you know, toot my own horn here, but I guess I'm, I'm trying to tell you from my own personal experience how this worked for me. And so I went out on YouTube. I found this guy who taught me how to program an HTML, CSS, JavaScript, all that kind of stuff. And I just sat down every single day and I watched those videos till I was blue in the face learning how to program a website. And then I was buying books and I'm reading these books. And I'm trying to go through them and just trying to pick it apart so I could learn how to do it. That was a skill set I was not taught at all. But you know what? I really took the initiative and I'm so glad that I did because I was able to stand up the investors podcast and Buffett's books and things like that. It's just been an awesome experience because I took this initiative that Cuban's talking about in the book and just go out and do it, get after it. Yeah. So, you know, I, I definitely agree with you. And, and, and also just briefly to, to touch on the, uh, the investors podcast, it was not like Preston, we knew anything there was about investing. It's not like we do that today. But basically, we are reading with the audience. And I have learned so much from just reading like book after book about something I didn't know anything about. Now, it might seem like we can come across an, as experts in you know, inflation or an expert in an ETF. But guess what? You can just buy a book about inflation. So it really doesn't have anything to do with, it, with your educational background. You can do that yourself. As Preston is saying, Go on YouTube. That's free. If you think 10 bucks is too much for a book, you just go online and, and find articles on that subject. There's plenty of knowledgeable people who want to share their, uh, their message to you. And I will say this. I, th I tell people this all the time. I said, read books, read books. Don't go on the internet and just, you know, research things there. I, I'm very biased when it comes to reading books versus doing cursory research on the internet because I, I look at it this way. So like Mark Cuban, so we're studying Mark Cuban. We read his book. We didn't read his blog, a couple of his blog posts. And the reason we read his book is because I have the opinion that if a person writes a book, they're putting their most treasured secrets in that book um, on, you know, for Mark Cuban, it'd be why he became successful. I'd be of the opinion that the things that he guards most and that he, you know, feels are the really the key recipes to his success. Yeah, I'm sure it's on his blog, but it's spread about, you know, tons of articles that he's posted in the past and you're going to have to like search around for it. But for his book, he's going to put all of that right into the, the meat and potatoes of his book. And guess what? It's just not Cuban. It's any other person out there. If, if somebody's going to write a 300 page book, you better believe that they've done a lot of research and they're putting all the key important parts of whatever research that they've thought of because it's taken them probably two or three years to write it. So I have a lot of respect for reading a book opposed to an article on the internet. Plus, you don't understand the reliability of the source. So I think it's so important that, that we talk about this point particularly. Yeah, so uh, uh, I definitely agree with you, Preston, because a book could definitely do something that, that online articles can't. It's, uh, for one thing, it's more coherent. Uh, ironically, that might be the, not be the case with this book because this is basically a blog post that's been edited and compiled into a book. But basically, a book is much more coherent, which will give you a broader picture. Another thing is that you need to have time to uh, reflect on what you're reading. And you need to have, I want to say, reach some kind of mental state to really digest what you have just read. And I don't know if it's just me that's old, but I think it's much harder to do that when you're reading a book or listening to a book if you're sitting uh, in your sofa. 
than if you are you know online and you can just check your email and on the right panel it says that this is the top 10 Kate Perry Taylor Swift whatever I mean <laughs> it's really going to confuse you a lot oh stig <laughs> we know it's it seems like you're not at. using the same web pages as I yeah I'm not <laughs> yeah. looking at those pages um and one one other thing that I wanted to throw out there. So a lot of people ask me, how do you read all these books so often? And I'll tell you, I do it through Audibles. Uh, Audibles.com, you can get right on, uh, I have my iPhone. It's just an app I download onto my iPhone. It's through Amazon. And uh, so I go out and I find the book. I put it on my on my phone. And then when I'm driving in my car or if I'm cutting grass or whatever it might be, I can listen to the book right there on my phone. So it's pretty awesome to... Uh, be able to read books at such a fast pace because I'm listening to them and any any of this time that you really look at as being just a total wasted downtime like driving in your car is now a time that you're like learning and you're you know turning that into like a learning laboratory is like what I like to refer to it as but okay we're going to go to the next point we cut a l- little bit off track there but I really like that point that Stig uh, captured so we're going to go to the next point in the book that we really liked one of the things uh, that I thought was really uh, interesting was uh, Cuban's view on the success of future business models. So he was talking about if you want to be successful in business and especially uh, online business, uh, you should be looking toward convenience. I mean, convenience was really the key word today. And he was saying something um, which is called least resistance. That was the term he used over and over again. And basically what he means by least resistance is uh, think of Amazon or think of YouTube. Like it's really easy just to, to keep on consuming that product because everything is tailored to you. And you can just sit back and you can just click on it and it will take you right to what you want to, uh, to see. So like real short, that was like his success of the future business model. And if you are in business, you should always aim to uh, create the least resistant uh, for your customer. So one of the things I want to talk about, because Cuban is big on this. In fact, I think if you even watch the Shark Tank, this comes out from time to time, from time to time. And that's this idea of being a salesperson and how important sales are. So I think Cuban has such an enormous respect for this because whenever he moved down to Texas and he was working for this uh, Your Business software, that was that was his forte. He had to go out there and he had to sell. He had to convince people, hey, you need this piece of software because if you don't have it, you're going to be losing money because you're not saving time or whatever the case might be. And so he developed these hardcore sales skills early on. And to this day, I think if you're a person that can come in and sell and convince him to buy something, you immediately grab his respect and he thinks very highly of you. Because I think at the end of the day, when you when you think about business in general, it's all about closing the deal and getting that sale. And so that's why he really has this strong reference. And he talks about that a lot in the book. He talks a lot about that on his blog of how important it is to be great at sales. Cold, just straight up cold calls to... Um, having a, a long pitch or whatever it might be. Um, he just has a lot of emphasis on how important it is to be able to sell. Um, and I think a lot of that comes down to your interpersonal skills and just being able to communicate effectively and having confidence in yourself when you're trying to sell something, being uh, you know creative with the way that you maybe pitch something. So there's, there's a lot that kind of comes together into that one piece of being a great salesman. And so it was just kind of a really interesting point of how much um, weight and interest he places on that skill set. Yeah, and you will never go out of fashion. It's not like uh, if you're saying, I don't know, I specialized in this media. I mean, that might be old in two, three, five years. You know, the concept of selling, you know, it is as valid today as where a thousand years ago. And I can promise you guys, in a thousand years from now, selling will be equally important as it is today. You know, all profit comes from the top line. So if you guys are looking to hone your your salesmanship skills, I'll give you two book recommendations. One is by the Joe Girard. Um, what's the name of the Joe Girard book, Stig? Something with cars, I want to say. Yeah. I, the, so I have not read this book, but I but, uh, Guy Spear told us about the book, and I, it's definitely one that I would like to read. Um, I, I'm pretty sure you're going to get a lot of good nuggets out of it. 
might be a little extreme at times from what I've heard, but this, there's this book by Joe Girard. He was the number one car salesman in the in the entire U.S. And he just talks about all these skills that he developed for selling cars and how he became, you know, I don't know how many he sold, but it's like an insane amount of cars. Um, so there's one book. It's by Joe Girard. And then the other one is Influence, which Stig and I already did an episode on. I can't remember which episode that was. Um, but the name of the book is Influence by Robert Cialdini. If you look in our episode list, you'll find that. And we also wrote a book summary for that if you want to download our book summary. But those two books will help you to become better at sales. Um, I would argue at a much higher level than anything else you could read. So there's two book recommendations if you're trying to hone those skills. Uh, another thing uh, I really found interesting about the book was that he said, uh, Cuban said, don't listen to your customers. That was one of his main secrets. And to someone like me that has, you know, taking all these marketing classes and all everything you hear is just like, you need to listen to the customer, you need to make market surveys, you need to make focus groups. Um, I was really surprised by this, but I just heard so many billionaires saying, you should never listen to your customers. Now, I think they were taking that to the extreme, but I definitely think there was something to it. If you are very visionary, and one, someone that comes to mind, aside from Cuban, is someone like Steve Jobs. He was also saying the same thing. You should not listen to your customers. Because basically, how can your customers know that they need an iPhone or they need an iPad when it's a disruptive technology that they don't know you know, they don't know the exists, they don't know they have the need for it. I think of another quote from Henry Ford. He said that if I ask people what they wanted, they would say they wanted faster horses. So you have these very visionary people that just think outside the box. Someone like Mike Cuban, who has just been, uh, for instance, with broadcast.com, no one has ever seen this before. And it's really hard to make focus group and ask people about something that they can't visualize. Yeah, I think that you'll find uh, a lot of these people that have that that same opinion like Steve Jobs. These guys were ultimate creators. So they these guys are bringing new products to the world. And that's why I think they really have this opinion. Like you can't ask the, the customer what it is that you'll want because here they are creating something that's new that's never been done before. And I think when you start asking people, hey, what do you think about this? Well, they're going to shoot holster. They're going to be like, oh, well, nobody's going to listen to the, the, the radio over the internet. Why would they do that? They can just turn on their radio and they can hear it. So you're always going to have those naysayers. And I think it is important to ignore people. If you really think you've got something and you understand how it could, you know, shape the world in a different direction, go for it, ignore them, you know, run after it. All right, Stig, you got the next point. Yeah, I think that, uh, there was a, a few, uh, a few good nuggets and one of them, um, which, what I, I guess I disagree with Cuban, or at least I have another uh, thing I wanted to, uh, to chip in with, is that he's saying that business is the ultimate sport. Now, it's not necessarily I disagree with that statement, but what he's saying is that in business, it's all about winning. It's all about if you can win, someone else has to lose, and you should always strive to be in the position where you would win that game. I mean, he's using all these sports metaphors, which is, uh, which is a lot of fun, and I can definitely see where he comes from. Now, I do agree that that is the life of business, but I think that for a lot of people, they might be better off going into, say, a mutual ben beneficial type of business. I think that if you are set yourself out for always competing with other people, and especially always thinking that for me to win, someone else has to lose, I think that you might not find the same satisfaction uh, in life as you otherwise could, unless you're as good as my Cuban, of course. And this was really something I thought a lot about after reading Guy Spears' book, uh, Education of a Value Investor, and something he also uh, thought a lot about. And if you should just you know, take one example from a personal life, for instance, if I am doing a podcast episode and I'm bringing on the guest, that guest, he will have the chance to tell his personal story. I will have a great show. And the audience will, you know, have a great experience learning from that person. I mean, we have three parties and everyone wins. Being in the middle of something like that, I think, gives you a lot of great things, gives you a lot of great emotions. But being in the opposite direction, like, for instance, I used to do as a commodities trader and a guy did, some, did something similar when he was an investment banker. 
someone has to lose before you can win on that trade. I kind of see where my Cuban is coming from, but I think you should think about carefully if that's the, the path you want to take. And something to highlight off of this point that you're making. So one of the key points that Cuban was making in the book, and I think he was trying to motivate people more than anything, is when you create your own business or you're, or you're working for a company, there is always somebody out there that's trying to kick your rear end. And they're trying to take you to the cleaning house. And so if you're not on your A game and you're not trying to you know, outsmart them or prepare yourself for something that's going to compete at a different level, you're going to get eaten alive. And I think that that's what he's really warning people with, with that metaphor where he's talking about business, where he's saying, you know, with my basketball team, it's, you know, only a couple minutes in the day and then it's over. But with business, it's 24 hours a day where somebody's trying to kick your butt. And that's where he's really trying to make people aware, like, hey, you might create a product, but guess what? There's going to be somebody right down the road who's trying to create a better product and take it to the extreme and basically put you out of business. So if you're not, if you don't have that competitive spirit and you're always trying to to bring your best, um, there's a chance that you might lose. And I think that that's uh, one of the main points he's really trying to make is trying to motivate people and tell them, hey, this is not, this is not for the faint of heart. Like you can't just start a business and think that it's going to continue to exist without somebody else trying to come along and, and kick your butt. So, and it's neat because when he talks about that, he says, you know, he has this saying, I always want to figure out how I could kick my own ass. That way I can make sure that somebody else doesn't come along and do it. And Steve Jobs also had a very similar thing out of his book um, where he says, I would much rather cannibalize myself than to let somebody else cannibalize my, my company. And what he's getting at is, you know, people will say, we're, we're asking them, why are you coming out with a new iPhone whenever you don't even have a competitor in the market back when iPhones first came out? You don't even have a competitor on the market that's even close to competing with you. And, you know, Steve Jobs said, well, if, if I don't cannibalize myself, somebody else will. And so that was his way of always staying ahead of the technology and always staying ahead of the, the competitors was, hey, I'll just cannibalize myself and I'll make it even a better product. And I think that that's a good approach. I think that's a really good approach because you never know when the day is going to come when somebody does come along with a better product. Yeah, and, and just to follow up on that, uh, Preston, I come to think about uh, a marketing class I saw with uh, Monish Pabrai uh, the other day. And this might sound weird because people usually know uh, Monish from his uh, from Pink Stocks. But what he's saying is, uh, if you look at entering a new market, uh, and again, think of someone like Steve Jobs, something like Mark Cuban, you should not think about if only I can get like 1% of this market, or if I can just get one tenth of a percent I would be rich because it's such a huge market. That's the wrong way of looking at uh, business. Uh, what Moniz Pabra is saying is that if you can get at least 60% of the new market, then you're not specific enough of what you want to do. Uh, and I think that really pretty much captures some of the really big thinkers of how they think of business and disruptive technologies. So I'm going to talk about a point here that uh, Cuban made in the book, which I thought was really good. And he says, you only have to be right once. Uh, and what he's really getting at is say you have a, a great idea and, and you try to create your own business or whatever the, the case might be. And it totally falls on its face. You know, Cuban would tell you, get up off your feet and dust yourself off and get back into the game and come back with something new. And his saying, you only have to be right once is, you can fail five, six, seven, eight times, but then you get that one business that, that hits and it does it right. Well, guess what? Now you're a multimillionaire or whatever the case might be. And so he's saying, stay in the game, stay after it. And it's really quite motivational. And in fact, I think the whole book is quite motivational. I think for somebody that might be just starting out and maybe you're in college or whatever, I would highly recommend this read. Because he gives out great pieces of advice, great business sense, um, little tidbits here and there. He has a couple lists where he talks about like my list of the top 12 things I learned, you know, in business and all that kind of stuff is very useful, especially when you're starting out. And I think it's very motivational for people to, uh, you know, understand that. Something else that I that I found to be highly uh, interesting and very useful for a lot of people that might be working a job where you have a boss he tells people that you need to think like an entrepreneur. The best employees are the ones that think like an entrepreneur. And what he means by that is you need to be thinking from the, the lens and the context of the owner. 
when you're that employee and I, I get frustrated whenever I go into a business and I, I say this to my wife all the time, she just rolls her eyes at me. I say, that person is thinking like an employee, not an owner. And what I mean by that is you go up to the counter, let's say you're at a fast food restaurant or you're at, you know, wherever. And the person's just sitting there and they could care less if you made a purchase, if you made an order or whatever the case might be, they could care less uh, what choice you made. Like you're asking them some questions and they're just kind of like, yeah, so they, they'll give you the, the cookie cutter answer. And then they're just looking like, I could care less if this person makes a purchase. In fact, I hope they leave so I don't have to do my job. And that is how an employee thinks. And what Cuban talks about is you need to think like an entrepreneur. You need to think like an owner. Not only can I make this sale, but how can I make this sale and then convince this person to go tell their best friend to come down here and buy from me after that? That's how an entrepreneur thinks because they're the owner. They want as much business as possible. So if you're an employee working at a company, I would really challenge you to take on this mindset. How can I think like the owner of this business? How can I try to bring more business and follow on business and compounding business for this owner? When you think like that, I'll tell you, you'll get promoted faster than anybody else in the block. And on top of that, you'll probably have the, the sense to maybe start your own business someday and run with it. But I, I thought that was a really good point. Yeah, and, and I definitely agree with you, Preston. This book is definitely well suited if you are a college student. And, and he addresses college students plenty of times. And I also want to say, especially if you are a college student, don't educate yourself to be an employee for a company. Educate yourself to be the owner of a company, even though you probably, like everyone else, has to start working for someone else. As Preston is saying, you'll get promoted faster. People will recognize you. And by the end of the day, you might create the network that you, uh, that you have to, to create your own business if that's what you want to do. But no one wants to promote you and no one wants to network with you if you think like an employee. Yeah, I was lucky as a kid. I, I'm just going to shoot you straight. Like both of my parents were entrepreneurs. My mother owned her own business. She uh, had her own dance studio. I want to say she had like two to 300 students. It was a lot of students. Uh, and then my dad, he owned this apartment uh, you know, company. So I kind of grew up in this environment where entrepreneurship was pretty much the way things worked. It wasn't like you you know, we're working for a boss. Like you had this entrepreneurial spirit in our house. And so I was kind of brought up around that. And it was, you know, I look back at how much of an advantage that was growing up as a kid. And I think a lot of people don't necessarily have that same experience, but I guess my point in telling you this is try to try to hone those skills of like, what's it take to become an entrepreneur? Because when you do, I think that you're going to find that you have so much more potential to increase your, your, your net worth, your income stream when you own something and you create it yourself. And I think that this would be a great starter book for a person to get that entrepreneurial spirit because that's what Cuban talks a lot about in this book. And that's probably one of the reasons I really liked it so much. All right. So there's more stuff that we could talk about with uh, Mark Cuban and the different points that he makes in the book. And I'll tell you, there's a lot of different chapters and there's a lot of different points. So uh, like we said, we can't highly recommend this book enough. Um, but what we're going to do at this point is we're going to take a question from our audience. And this question comes from Satosh. My question for you guys is about inflation. How likely is a scenario where an economy can experience a severe inflation such that it can potentially invalidate the currency? Something that many economists call as hyperinflation. In such a case, the currency would essentially lose its value and all our investments and liquid assets would essentially become useless. I read about such an event happening few years back in Zimbabwe and in several other countries in the early 1900s. Is this something that as an investor I should be worried about? If yes, what's the best way to be prepared for such an event? Uh, is considering investing in fixed or tangible assets like real estate a good idea? So Santosh, this is a really uh, great question. And I think that it's a question that a lot of people have on their mind because of the current you know, conditions around the world. So when you talk about inflation versus hyperinflation, I think the most prominent example in history is you know Germany back in the 1920 timeframe. Uh, the reason that Germany went through the hyperinflation back in the 1920s is because they had enormous war reparations that they had to pay from uh, from World War I uh, finishing up. And 
those reparations were in such a large amount that uh, Germany just couldn't possibly pay it all back. So they print more money and devalue it. And it's just a total disaster when you go back into the 1920s. I think the picture of the guy with the wheelbarrow of money was from that time period. And I want to say that that picture was taken like around 1922 or somewhere around in there. So really, when you're trying to, to understand what causes hyperinflation, it really comes down to the domestic obligations being in such exceedance of what that country's ability to pay and to collect tax revenues, it just gets completely out of whack. Um, you know, I would argue back in the 1920s for Germany, the, the payments that they needed to make to all the different foreign countries for all the war reparations were far in exceedance of what the company could bring in with their tax revenues. And that's the reason that they went through that. Plus you had, you know, some extreme leadership in place following world war one. And it was just, you know, a crazy time. And I think when you go around the world and you look at all these different hyperinflation scenarios, you're going to find that that country was in enormous amounts of debt that far exceeded what they could bring in. So when we look at the United States during, you know, right now, I don't necessarily think that United States is anywhere near that scenario where the hyperinflation could, you know, occur. I could be completely wrong. They've done an enormous amount of quantitative easing. We're going to be having a guest on our show here in, in a, what is it, October that we're having Colin on the show, Stig? Yeah, it's middle of October or something, yeah. We'll have a link to Colin's website uh, in our show notes. And Colin wrote this pa- this white paper on how, the, how modern monetary policy works. Uh, and he talks a lot about what you're getting at here. And I want to say his white paper is like 50 or 60 pages long. It has been highly downloaded across the finance industry. And I highly recommend people read this because it's, Uh, Quite fascinating how well he depicts the modern uh, monetary system. And he gets into debunking a lot of things like money multipliers and how it's going to impact inflation. Uh, I know back during the the 2008-2009 crash, he had a bunch of people out there saying that we were going to have hyperinflation with all this quantitative easing. Colin went out very early, I want to say like in the 2009-2010 time frame, and said, that's not going to happen. And here's all the reasons why. So we give him a lot of kudos for calling something so obscure that I think, you know, you talk to any modern economist, they'd probably have told you that we would have had hyperinflation in the United States with all the QE. And Colin was one of the few people that said that we wouldn't because I think he, you know, really had a fundamental understanding and knowledge of how things work. Um, I want to also highlight that back in the, um, I want to say it was the late 70s or early into the 1980s in the United States, you had an enormous amount of devaluation that happened with the dollar. I think the dollar lost almost 50% of its value over like a five-year period during that time frame. That's what I think um, people are going to see this time around where you're going to see the, the dollar and every other world currency that's competing for market share right now continue to lose its value. And that's how people are being taxed. And how that's how this deleveraging is actually taking place is through the devaluation of the currencies. Oh, I'm, I'm so sad, Preston, that you're talking about uh, the vulnerability of the dollar. Because, you know, me uh, living in, in, in Denmark and we're looking towards <laughs> the euro, looking at the dollar and just thinking, now, this is a safe haven because I have no trust in ECB whatsoever. So... <laughs> I think this is a great discussion, and one book that really comes to mind uh, here is The Black Swan, which we did uh, not too long ago by uh, Nassim Taleb. And the reason why I'm saying is, is really to continue what Preston said, because Preston said that he thinks that this is really uh, highly unlikely, and I completely agree. I would say that for hyperinflation to, uh, to happen in one, one of the major developing countries right now would be... I, I wouldn't put a percentage on, but it's it's highly, highly unlikely. But again, we've seen so many crazy things in the financial markets, and and there have been a black swan. So, so could it happen? Yes, it could. And and what you're also asking about, Santos, is so what should you invest in uh, to prevent that? I think one one other thing I I probably should look into is to look into Talib's fund. I actually heard that he has like a black swan fund. I actually don't know how that's uh, how he invests. That could be really interesting. But uh, if I just should think of some of the asset classes, type of assets that you uh, that you can't buy, it would be something like tips, which is inflation-proved bonds. 
I mean, that might be uh, by, might be a suggestion. Uh, another thing which you just yourself is real estate, and the reason why you would do something like real estate is because you have a fixed rate mortgage, and it's it's in a given nominal uh, number. So so uh, basically, uh, what you have uh, borrowed to to buy the building uh, almost gets depleted, uh, and also that you can raise your rent as there is more inflation. Other asset classes would be something like commodities, oil, and, and gold, something that people usually plug into when there's a high uncertainties, uh, which are in type of, uh, of inflation. Um, so at least that is like the traditional asset classes. And you might even include something like stocks too, which is not fully inflation proof, but like partial um, inflation proof. So I think that would be my best advice to you if, if that it's in the direction you're going. Am I doing that myself? Uh, no. Not only because I, I trust the Fed, because uh, I'm not really sure I do, <laughs> just more than ECB, but I think the position I'm in and, and, and where I look at the, uh, how I look at the world right now, I don't think I should be paying a premium to someone to, uh, to protect myself against hyperinflation. So I'm going to talk about market conditions right now in August of 2015 real briefly. So one of the concerns that I've got right now is the strength of the dollar. So the dollar is getting extremely strong. You're seeing all these different currencies pour into the dollar. You're seeing them pour into the 10-year treasury. And so for the United States domestically, that's not a good thing because what's happening is, is it's really hard for us, the, the import versus export piece of that, it's really cheap for us to buy things outside of the country but very expensive for outside countries like China or people over in Europe to buy things in the U.S. Well, that's really bad because an enormous amount of the, the revenue being generated by these U.S. companies are all from foreign uh, currencies and from foreign countries. So as the dollar gets stronger, that's going to be an enormous amount of pressure on the U.S.'s ability to continue to grow their GDP. That's where I've got a concern moving forward, and I think that with these pressures mounting in the U.S., I think that the Fed is going to be in an extremely tricky situation because if they start tightening, um, meaning that they basically start to reverse all that uh, quantitative easing that they've been doing, and instead of buying uh, bonds, they're going to start selling these bonds, and then you're going to have a flood of bonds on the market, which is going to raise interest rates in the U.S. If they start raising interest rates in the U.S., that's going to only you know make the dollar stronger yet and that's going to put more pressures on the U.S. businesses. So I don't necessarily see how the Fed's going to be able to do that this year. Um, does that mean that they might still do it? Yeah, absolutely, they might still do it. And in fact, if they do uh, actually do this, I think they're going to do it at just a small piece just to be able to say that they did. Like I don't think that they're going to even remotely adjust interest rates that much that people might not even notice. But I think it'll be maybe a psychological movement because they're going to say that they did it. You're really at this pivotal point in time where we don't necessarily know which decision they're going to make, but we know pretty much whatever decision they make, it might not be a good one. So it's going to be interesting to see how it plays out. Uh, we're watching it very closely. We'll be sure to, and this is what I want to highlight to everybody. If you sign up on our list, uh, either through Buffett's books or the Investor's Podcast, we type up an executive summary of every book that we read. So this book on Mark Cuban, we got an executive summary we're going to send out to everybody for free. So go and sign up on our list. Uh, also, when we send out those executive summaries, we'll type up you know, our current thoughts on the current market conditions and just kind of give you some thoughts like this in the email. Uh, we have no spam whatsoever, no advertising, no nothing like that. So if you're signing up on our list, you're just getting these executive summaries. And then in the body of the email, you're getting our, our notes on the current market conditions. So uh, thanks for joining us and we'll see you guys next week. Thanks for listening to The Investor's Podcast. To listen to more shows or access to the tools discussed on the show, be sure to visit www.theinvestorspodcast.com. Submit your questions or request a guest appearance to The Investor's Podcast by going to www.asktheinvestors.com. If your question is answered during the show, you will receive a free autographed copy of the Warren Buffett Accounting Book. This podcast is for entertainment purposes only. This material is copyrighted by the TIP Network and must have written approval before commercial application. 